I'm Madeline Blair, and this is Unlocked, a show about opening possibilities so that when you are hit with the unexpected, you have the options to move on. This show is about helping those of us who pursue our careers with seriousness that boggles the mind. And that's true whether you're a formal leader or not, because we are always the leader of yourself. You're always the leader of your career and perhaps even your families. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, I just want to remind you that we're going to be monitoring questions and comments during the show, so please add them. When I work with organizations, I often am asked to help them solve a problem. Now, one of my first challenges is to get them to think about something other than problems. Instead, I help them to think about what things would be like if they were exactly how they wished they would be. Now, I don't mean pie in the sky kinds of wishes. They need to be wishes that feel just familiar enough to imagine they might really happen, that they actually can see themselves in and their people in those futures. For example, I ask when, them to begin with stories about times when they were performing well, then as they define where they want to go when the problems have been solved, they can actually recognize those strengths, those awesome characteristics they already have acting in the future. We will be talking today about future forming. Can organizations or individuals really form their future? Find out that we are the only ones who can by using our own stories to build the world of the future. You know, because once you have attractive, unattractive, even compelling voice of the future, there still need to be ways to keep you moving toward it. That the day to day doesn't chip away at the feasibility of the dream. How many of us let our own personal dreams fade as we meet with resistance? How many of us have observed that those business goals kind of drift. How do you keep them alive, vibrant, and full of life? Let's see what our guest has to offer. My guest today is Case Hugendeck. Case, welcome to Unlocked. Thank you. Case is the founder of Appreciative Inquiry Academy, the CFO of Constructive unconferences, I love that phrase, unconferences, and a thinking partner in strategic organization development. He is joining us today from Spain. He says that his mission is humanization of organization. Now, that's something I can get behind. I'm always reminding people that organizations are actually made up of people, thank you very much. They aren't people themselves but they are made up of them, the humanization of organization. So Case, <clears throat> shall we begin? I, I'm always curious as to whether what you're doing today was anything you envisioned as a child. And you know what brought you to where you are today? Now, first of all, let me thank you for this invitation and uh, how nice to meet you so many times in the last weeks in several occasions and getting to know you better. And now being your partner in this conversation. And uh, a welcome to everybody who's looking now or in a certain now, which takes place in the future, <laughs> which will be now. And this CFO um, is not about chief financial officer, it's chief facilitating officer. <laughs> And of course, I borrowed that from a good friend who made that up. So yes, this there's always that uh, some of those tipping points. And when you ask me this, um, because what am I doing now? I'm being self-employed. So that tipping point that changed uh, this part of my life where your question is referring to is that I stepped out of being an employee of organizations and institutions and became self-employed. And actually, 
I, I need uh, for every story today. I need to have the short version. But actually, this was a story I wasn't allowed to tell for the first five years because my employer was quite embarrassed about it. <laughs> the fact is, I became appointed for three-year contract, being the director of organization transition support at DHL. You know, the and at the Express Logistics. They were in a process of merging with the German mail company, with Danzas. This was a worldwide huge program. And in 25 regions, uh, people like me were appointed to look after the people side of the change. That means that I was not responsible for the, you know, the economic part of the change. And actually, the one who was responsible didn't want to speak to me for the first year of my assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take the story, uh, the story short. I did some moves in trying to, to, to do my job well and, and following the, the objectives, the company objectives. And that actually made my boss, the human resource director, um, ask me to leave the company three times in two years. <laughs> <laughs> He was also a bit embarrassed with this, but it had to do with politics and power play and all those things. And the third time, actually in the morning, I was given sort of offered a beautiful job beyond the change to do organization development. And in the afternoon, I gave a call, I was like, sorry, it's, it's off. And then I said, okay, then I'm off. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind, you pay me that last year. <laughs> I'm a father of six children, uh, mortgage, study finance. Uh, this is my chance to become a free self-employed person. I wouldn't have got a loan from a bank or something for this. So uh, you will be uh, <laughs> you will be my uh, my uh, the, the the foundation of this. So actually, this is with good feelings. I understand the politics by now. Um, it's it gave me the chance to become an even more free person. But you can understand, I acted maybe a little bit too free sometimes in the circumstances <laughs> of where you're supposed to do something else, um, to do follow rules or follow follow <laughs> the boss. Hmm. Just give a, a bit of an idea. Uh, <laughs> yes, more, but... it does. It tells me a great deal also about your integrity because clearly you wish to be who you are and i i sometimes think that when we act and operate in that frame uh we can do some amazing things and it's always to me it turns out to be very um life affirming because people see that integrity and feel that i, I wonder if in this time where you have been on your own uh is there a project that kind of reminded you of why you made this break? Yeah, the, the, the break was like from the one job contract to the other. Yeah, that was the break. I think I was always in organization development. I had this idea of what I didn't know yet, calling humanization of organization. But let's say, an, an, what do you call it, uh, an exemplary project would be my, my actually the city council of the city where I was born in The Hague in Holland um, in the Netherlands where actually I'm for for 10 years now I'm sort of um, undercover an appreciative inquiry trainer lecturer coach some friends in the organization they put me on the internet with the training twice a year it's not official. I don't have a contract. So individuals in that city council can decide to enroll in my training and to ask their boss for a budget for it. So it's an individual thing, and I am allowed to do so. During this process of 10 years, meeting people, uh, bringing appreciative inquiry very slowly <laughs> into that huge organization, 10,000 civil servants, the, you get to know, of course, also the, the worries and the concerns and, and uh, problems even that uh, people that are not so happy with. Yes, they're happy with their jobs. Most of the civil servants really are 
have the good intentions, but sometimes they structure the, the hierarchy, the quality of leadership and management could be better. And more and more, I got this urge of what can I do about that? But also my circle of friends grew. And then I think it's two years ago, suddenly I got the, the, the question case, could you propose? Case, we are already for six years creating job profiles for management, the, the new management style and this and that. But I think I, he was speaking from the central organization, I don't think that the managers even don't know that these profiles have been made. So can we do it your way, appreciative inquiry? And I said, that means that there's not a central project team trying to describe things. Then we should invite those 750 managers for a large conversation. And that has been going on since 2021. Uh, we reached at least 350 managers in conversation. And we didn't bring them how they should be. We asked them the best of their experiences what they think of serving a city. And slowly, slowly, this went going on. Did we reach all 750? No. <laughs> the, the, the senior general management team smelled something. What is happening here? <laughs> and they wanted to have a plan. So then suddenly the whole process stopped and all people started to write plans. This plan is still under, you know, uh, under construction and... I'm actually in the in the process of waiting for a go on and hoping that that we will decide that actually having these conversations is the intervention. We don't need a profile. You know, that is what is so characteristic of appreciative inquiry for the audience. In case you don't know that phrase, it really is talking about how you go in into an intervention. And in fact, even the very question that you ask is already an intervention. So I can imagine these managers talking about how they've worked well together or some successes and that they probably have already changed the way in which they manage. Is that your sense of it, Case? Yes, and they've never been asked such questions. Yeah. Because when they are, because men are 750 managers, most of them have a manager themselves. Yeah. So in their, you know, their, their appraisal, conversation it's about did you reach results did you do this did you do that but not about okay what are you proud about is there a, an, 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 a one of your employees one of your workers that you are proud of why yeah and you know that kind of conversation brings different kind of knowledge to the table knowledge that can actually be used by other people it's not it's not yes. just this is you know awards or anything like that it's hey this is useful because it worked yes. here yes and here you see the this was taking place in the in the corona covid period so it was all online and then you see the beauty of because when you do these things online and you take a, a google jamboard or a padlet you can actually collect these ideas and opinions. So we have a registration of all those beautiful stories. Wow. So that's, that's nice. nice. Yeah. I love this question. I, I love the moment that somebody asked me a question I, I didn't expect. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I have a website full of services and things, and, but if somebody asks something that is not there, that, that is great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I'm going to ask you a question that you know I'm going to ask you <laughs> because our topic today is future forming. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what future forming really is. Yes, that is that is something from a few angles, from a few perspectives. I think when you be theoretical, then you could say it is interacting with the future that un unfolds itself. Wow, okay, so, so I don't get it. Or it's the Taoistic path the path that unwinds because, not when you walk on it, but because you walk on it. So you create a path. But that is still philosophical. Then there's this metaphor of building the ship whilst you are sailing it. That's already something, okay, that uh, seems a little bit uh, impossible, but at least you have a picture. So 
Is it not sinking then? No, that depends how you, <laughs> which kind of intention you start. with the hull, right? <laughs> yeah, but then even more close, you remember that you were in the back of the car with your parents and asking, uh, going on a vacation and asking, when are we there? Yeah. When do we arrive at the destination, at the camping site or whatever? And then they might have said, I think, because I said it to my children, we are already with on holiday. <laughs> Look outside, enjoy it. <laughs> the scenery and we were always waiting for some sort of result and the only result is that you then start taking all the things out of the car and, and put up the tent i go in terms of future forming into appreciative inquiry of course appreciative inquiry or appreciative inquiry in the in, in your tone of voice um now read my book i would say to to get in there but the thing i i mentioned before that when you ask someone a question, then actually you, you, you tap into his or her brains and, and the other needs to do something. Eh? What was the last time that you were? You the other needs to do something. And that doing is not only thinking, it's getting there, bringing the person to that moment, what was powerful. So that is a change because getting connected to powerful things gives you energy. And actually, so this is really future forming in the sense that this person just because you asked one question might act differently than he or she would have acted without that question i think that's really amazing just this and it's very simple also but there are of course several kinds of questions do you like coffee or tea may not be future forming so much there's a beautiful poem I like to share at some point in this, maybe at the end, that I think that is, I can't do it better to explain. But there's also theory about future forming, which comes from Otto Scharmer, the, 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 uh, the theory you uh, expert, and this sense of presencing. What is presencing? You get in there first, you open your mind, and you, you actually start seeing what you see. I would say, if we still see a problem, then we may not be yet there because what you see is a situation and we call it a problem. If we just can see it as a situation, then we have an open mind. Then we go deeper, open heart. Can you see that is more like sensing from not only your perspective, but from other perspectives that you are in it. But then, and that is the ultimate, in the down in the you, can you be with an open will so you let go of your will what does it mean you will live on but not only thinking what you were doing it is mingled with something that is calling you and this is in the you something is mixed your your you at this moment is mixed with something that is calling it's like you're surfing on a wave which you yourself created the wave wasn't there and this is this strange interaction between you and something that is happening. And as we speak, we are also going through time. And this is the presencing. And I think presencing is absolutely a future forming activity that you even can do in yourself. And then, of course, there's the word generativity. Uh, we will come back to that later, maybe. But this is a word I studied <laughs> for five years now. And in the essence, it means to, to beget and to appear. So it has to do with bringing forward, like in like people in biological sense, and we, especially women, but you need a man also, uh, you need some things <laughs> to bring forward your species. That is the ultimate bringing forward. And, but it's also, it means also to appear that suddenly something happens. You are also in that field of things that suddenly happen, the unexpected. And what kind of stance will you have towards something that suddenly happens? And so these two are, I think, I won't have given a definition of future forming yet, because it's a processual thing. And with definitions, we might fix it. And I can't fix it. My brilliant assistant in DHL always asks, can you give me a definition of a process? What is the definition of system? And that someday I, I got him and I said, what is the definition of definition? <laughs> so maybe.
maybe we get somewhere. <laughs> I really, I really love this because I'm thinking of a time when I was working with a group, and I think I told this story in on my show maybe a few months ago. Uh, there were three units, separate units that had never worked as one, and they were asked to combine, get together, and now start acting as if you're one. And and I, I was. I, I, I was very pleased to hear it because I, I, I actually agreed that the three functions really work better if they were together. So they said, come in and help us do this. And I love this, this you thing that you talk about where you, you're, okay, you're, you're, you're in your day to day, da, 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 da. And now, oh, you're beginning to melt in a sense and beginning to see possibilities. Okay. So I said, all right, I'll do this. And they gave me all of six hours to do this. Huh. <laughs> I said, oh, well, uh, you know, we'll do what we can in six hours. So I had them tell stories of what they did. So unit one told the stories, unit two told their stories, unit three told their stories. And, and I could see in the room, there was, I mean, you can look at faces and you can see that there was an appreciation now of what, oh, that's what they do. Oh, you know? So there's this realization. And I said, okay, now you have all this stuff. Think of it as a big pile of stuff in the middle of the room. Now let's make something from it. And I had them go off. And, and in their own way, they had, to, they had to create a story that brought it all together. That group did it in those six hours. They finished, that, they, they finished writing the story, so to speak. Yes. And, and it was exactly what you said. They, they began to be it as they wrote it. I went back two weeks later and they were like six months down their, their, their actions, you know, their, their plan. They had yeah. done it. Um, so I love this example. I'm, I'm going to use this. I'd like this metaphor of the you. It's very yes. good. Thank you. Yes. And the, the melting. I love your word melting. It's yeah. because it's, it's, it's not you, it's you and your circumstances and yeah. they yeah. both are actors in it. Yeah. yeah. Not you, doing something with your circumstances the circumstances also do something with you there's a beautiful theory about it the structuration theory of giddens but no 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 no, no theories let's no, stick, no, to, no let's stick to reality Although it's nice that sometimes you think of it and you think oh i'm a bit crazy nobody understands me because this happens often in organizations <laughs> and that there at least is someone which wrote a book and says actually what you're talking about makes sense and <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> let's let's tease this out a little bit because now you you're working with you're working with the city, and obviously aside from COVID, <laughs> what were some of the challenges that you met there, of actually helping people believe and act upon what they were doing? Yes, of course. You know this. I think the phrase I heard the most often in the last ten years is case case this is how things are working here <laughs> we are a city council and this you know and and of course i i can't be fired in that city because i'm an external or sort of on the edge of the so th there is a challenge the, the challenge is and my challenge or my 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 initiative is can i make them see things differently the same things uh, with your uh, with your with new eyes, so to say, mm -hmm. and that's like okay, because everybody is complaining about hierarchy. But if you are ten thousand people, the hierarchy is not. It's not a problem that you are a pyramid. The only thing is that you think that someone higher in the pyramid has more power. That that is, but that you need some structure, that there's a department A and B, that's fine. But they also consider this as, as part of the problem. But I can't design any alternative structure for this organization to be better. It has to do with visions of how is how does work look like. So one of, one of the things that helped me is sort of this word organization. How do you picture organization? What do you see when you look at organization? That is question one. But what do you see when you look at the organization you would love to work in? 
So in the first thing, you get answers like structure, bosses, job profiles. And the other, you get fun, uh, happy citizens. So it is interesting. And now there's this beautiful book, Garrett Morgan, Images of Organization. Yeah. Uh, with the first image, maybe lots of people see organizations as a kind of machine. A machinery and the people are the parts in it and you just replace the parts and then the machine will be running again. And then he put seven different ways, like a flux or also a psychological prison, or just to bring, and, and it, it's a thick book, but only it needs only eight pictures on the wall. <laughs> and just put those on the wall and just say, well, okay, can you imagine that this same organization has all these eight manifestations? And where do you see this? And where do you see that? And then something starts flowing and then they sometimes... Because, you know, I don't think we should be thinking of the construct of organization so much every day. And somehow, lots of civil servants are constantly thinking about managers, organizations. <laughs> Why? Think about citizens and things that has to be done. So it's about your idea of things. And I think the same is, I, I, I said it already in the appreciative inquiry. Why would we call something a problem when it's, not yet a problem because it's still a situation mm. and from there and it, actually i think the most uh, uh profound astronauts they say houston we've got a situation and i think we would <laughs> we don't want to be there when they're when they're calling that to ground control <laughs> we've got a situation <laughs> because but they stay cool and i think this is also a way of being cool to what you see and then what you see, if you are cool, when you look at your organization like the City Council of The Hague, then you see beautiful colleagues. Then you don't see that, that negative uh, person, that uh, dot, dot, dot of a boss. Then you mm -hmm. ask yourself, okay, how's the boss today? How is he today? What does he do uh, at home? And, and you could ask, and then he's, he also tells bedtime stories. You know, it's, it's <laughs> what do you see people and some offices. Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, I think this is sort of, it's about how you see things. That's interesting. But at the same time, we're constantly writing reports and not reading them, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you, that you really think a bit about it as, I mean, I talked about the, in the beginning about wishes, but wishes are, 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 are a vision. And so what you want to do is have people see around them more clearly so that the vision becomes real. You know, you also talk about seven organizational processes, forgive me, that you did, uh, but that can lead to creating a future generatively. And I love the word generatively. I love the fact that it also means to appear. Uh, I find that very exciting. Yeah. Uh, so we don't have time to talk about all seven of them, but maybe we can talk about one or two of them. But what I'm going to do is let you think about which two you're going to do, Case. And in the meantime, I'm going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, Case will give us one or two of his examples. Okay.
Welcome back. I'm Madeline Blair and you're watching Unlocked. And today we're talking with Case Hugendijk. Hugendijk, excuse me, let me pr pronounce that right. Um, we're talking about future forming and I had just asked him about some of his organizational processes that he uses. And I asked, said, pick one or two. So Case, take it away. <laughs> Some association. I'm reading your book, by the way. <laughs> and I know now that I, this is the cliffhanger that there's four plus one uh, <laughs> good practices. And being a mathematician, I like those calculations. It must be five. So, um, and it made me also think of this, your name, my son, Woody. He's a gifted skateboarder, been in the X Games. And then in these tournaments, you're, get, you're getting cold when you need to go for your round. And then they said, uh, uh, Woody, hooch and ditch. And then I said, Woody, yeah, it's you, <laughs> hooch and ditch. And so we we are used to having all the uh, uh, pronunciations of the name Hogendijk. We need, I think, Dutch tongue and teeth for that. <laughs> so, the, so, and this is about language. So, it is about, so I love the word confused because that has everything to do with this, this sage Confucius, the old Chinese Confucius who said, we need to use the language well. And then you ask me, okay, so I found out that from studying the word generativity in an organizational context, besides the fact that it's being used incorrect in most of the books it's being used, there's assumed that we know that it is. It's being used in the wrong way. If you study it nah, for five years, and I think I've read every book that uses the word generativity in it. And then at some point you find out that generativity can only be a quality of a process. Actually, you can't speak. And then you may ask later on, you can't speak of a generative person or a generative painting. Mm -hmm. You can only speak of the generativity of a process that is happening between you and that painting. And maybe the same painting won't do anything to you. And I might be sh shedding tears because of it. So there, the generativity is something of in between. And so it's, it's a quality of a process. And then you come into something that is either obvious or not, depending how you appreciate the word process like and that came out of the study that are you looking in organizations at processes things you know activities that deliver something a service or a product whether these are gener generative and you could test or detect this on seven possible manifestations whether they are relational actionable idea giving uh, my article, my next article is just on the edge of being, we have some minor revisions and then it maybe it will be published. I think I dare to say. So then you can read more about it. So um, I think, and then, you know, um, where was I? Because that. Now, I, this is what happens when you do appreciative inquiry, by the way. So this is not a this is not a blackout, I can assure you. But then you start thinking of, okay, what is now really the next necessary, the next thing you want to say? I start to stumble. And then I say, oh, I'm just finding the next fantastic question. So You just melted. You just melted. You just melted a little, and now you have to reform. <laughs> so if you want to go in like, okay, there's generative processes and there are so also degenerative processes. So that has to do something with they help, they contribute to an organization going further to be more generative, to be more future oriented or less. And so one of the things is to find if you are in organizations like a consultant or a manager, a professional, then the invitation is to, to look out for these processes that actually are generative and that is the first exercise to find out whether you recognize them or not and so they must be relational it's not like a machine that's running and that books come at the end it's people talking but let me just 
read you one paragraph of this article, and maybe these are the best words, although it may be a little bit academic. The word process is so commonly used in organizations that one might miss the view on processes as presented in this paper, which may be quite different from one's usual view. When looking at the business process in order to know what the status or quality is, it's common practice to assess its results, products, deliverables. What we propose to organizational generativity is to also look at, or better in, the process itself, which, since it is relational, is not to be done by measuring or taking a snapshot. The alternative way of seeing is to sense and perceive a process to find out whether its ongoingness resembles the seven manifestations we have derived in this paper. And then some practical, a brainstorming process may fill the walls with hundreds of post-it notes, but that doesn't mean it is generative. Conversely, collective silence in a creative process may be regarded as unproductive, but can be just as likely to contribute to generativity. It's not only the perspective from which the OD practitioner looks at the process, rather the way each participant, or better yet, each partaker, looks at the process affects its generativity. So that was a paragraph from, Ooh. wow. This is interesting. As you were reading that, what I was beginning to feel from that is that there's real action and movement. It, it is not a stable thing. So you can't put your hand on it. Say, like, this is it. It's it's movement. It's, it's, it's like looking at a river. Yeah. How do you look at a river? It's like you're standing at, at the side, the river's floating by, but you stand here, so you look. Yeah, what, what do you see? A river, that's what we say. A lot of water. <laughs> Shift coming by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, actually, what we are doing is, actually, we are living this challenge you, you mentioned before, because we shouldn't talk so much about, for example, appreciative inquiry. We better do it. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about eating or let's have a dinner together. So it's much better. Oh, no, Although, that's a great metaphor. This I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and there are many more things you better do than talk about. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, then it leads to another question. Since this is an ephemeral thing, I mean, it, it exists for the moment. It may continue to exist, but it's still. Uh, how can I be more generative in my own life as well as my work? There's another snack in here. Uh, generativity takes two to tango. So the question is, how can I be more generative? Is an interesting thing. So how can I? So it's more like the question, what can I do that when I interact with another, that that interaction becomes more generative. Of course, I wouldn't be doing all this. I'm not a, a linguistic uh, reviewer. I want to make organizations a better place uh, to help them. Mm -hmm. So it's about, can we influence this? Can we be? And then my, one, my conclusion was, sorry, there, there, there isn't no such thing as a generative leader. But then here's the snack. And this is, uh, this is another philosopher, uh, Derrida, who plays with words. And if you just picture the word generative written with N-A-double-R, then there suddenly there is the word narrative in it. Mm -hmm. So it's a new word. I came up with it. It suddenly appeared to me. And I thought, okay, we can't be generative with an E because that is a process quality. But we can be or become or try to learn to be generative and you feel this has to do with uh, at least the capability to understand the flow of stories to add to stories so storytelling is at least part of the practices and i'm still in a phase that i'm finding out what you can do to be a better generative with a double r person so that is actually my answer so I would say, read the article to get the idea of visioning. <laughs> and I'm writing the book. So before the end of this year, if somebody's listening here, the, <laughs> before the end of the year, it will be, a, there will be a clue. But you will, you feel already, this is, there's a book, 2019, John Ehrenfeld, 
the right way to flourish. He refers to the right hemisphere of the brain. So flourishing is not an eff- and the result of our left structure brain. It's flourishing is a quality of this more fluid, romantic thing. So I am sure that we have to develop qualities that more come from the right brain, although the theory says that these things should also interact. They work together, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I keep thinking about this and I, yeah. I did not appreciate that gener- generative things, the E-N part of it, um, required a second, it's in other words, it's an interaction. So when I asked the question, how can, a, how can you be more generative? Uh, one of the thoughts that occurred to me as you spoke like that, I said, well, if I'm a leader, one of the things I might do to create a generative moment with my staff or whatever is to listen. Am I here? Am I getting it right? You're getting it very right. And then we go back to that presence institute that says there are four levels of listening. You know, the downloading, listening, (laughs) the factual listening, the empathic listening, and level four, you can guess, generative listening. Yes, there is a quality of listening that actually makes things or relations or activities generate. It's not a generator itself, but the listening can contribute to... I want to tease this out, Case, because this is interesting. (laughs) Downloading, I understand. You're talking, I'm presumably hearing the words. What was the second one? Yeah, the downloading is, uh, oh, how was your weekend? I was in France. Ah, oh, did, did you have a nice holiday? No, I was going to right. the funeral of my friends. Uh, so, yeah. you know, that's right. it. Factual listening is what good researchers do. Try to get the fact. Right. What is really happening? Okay, Staying yeah. Without judging. Um, and Otto Sharma, you can see a seven-minute video on YouTube. And then, then you open the... Then you open something more of the gates and empathic listening is when you listen and you try to be listening from the position of the other mm-hmm. from there so that's interesting and if you then this is this we can do a training of two days for this but okay and if you go into the generative listening it's listening from the field behind the other from what is calling the other and like appreciative inquiry is also, it's not about me. It's about my questions, uh, inviting the other to take a step, take a move. This and is, the narrative listening is, is, it goes beyond that. Beyond that. You know, this reminds me a great deal of some narrative studies uh, and narrative practice, which Paul Costello and I used to teach. Oh, gosh, it must have been at least 10 years ago. And we would talk, of, we would have people tell a story or even just a part of a story. But then there was a listening audience with jobs and they had to listen downloading, they had to listen for factual, but they also, and and empathic, you know, but they also had to think about all the field around. So it was a very comprehensive and in the end, very generative uh, process. Invariably, the person who was I'll call them the subject where they were telling the story, saw all kinds of new possibilities in front of them uh, as a result of people tell, you know, feeding back to them, this is this is what I saw. So I love this, this enrichment of this idea of listening. Oh, we should give this audience for the next Christmas dinner. We call it a round of appreciation. Actually, it's not coming from appreciative inquiry, but it's coming from the circle way practice. Just you take one family member and all the others share something that they deeply appreciate in that person. If you are that person, you get red, you get hot, you get embarrassed. But if you go around this, it takes quite a time. Yeah. But then the atmosphere is like if you are in the clouds. Yes. And you can do this also with teams, project teams that know each other already for a few months, never asked that just start a team meeting with, okay, before we go, what do you appreciate so much in Madeline? And 
John and Madeline gets redder and redder, but it is like, wow, we see each other. We are actually a we. Yeah. And there's so much theory about teams, but I think this is what a team makes a team. Yes, very much so. You know, it also reminds me of, of a Native American practice where if a young person does something bad, the, the tribe comes together and they don't tell the young person what they did that was bad. They, they tell the young person the things, the good things that they had done, the good things about them. And there is this healing, of course, that goes on in that process because the, the attention is on the qualities that they bring to the tribe. You, get t you don't get feedback anymore. You get 10 feet forwards. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and at some point, I think that child would say, you forget something. I also did something bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not important. We want you to know what you did well. Yeah. This is, it's, I get, really, this is making me warm inside. Eh? This, this kind Good. of things. Good. We can do this. We can facilitate this. We can be the chief facilitating officer of this kind of process. <laughs> Now that I know what the CFO means, yes. well, you know we're. I can't believe that we have, we've almost we're almost out of time. Not quite though, but I'm always like to, to uh, have my guests share with, with our listeners. Uh, assuming that you are a young person, you are just starting out your career. You're a twenty something, a thirty something. What what advice would you give? What what do you suggest? Um, especially if they're serious about their career, what do you suggest to them that we've brought from this conversation around generativity? I prepared for this, and here it comes. I, I happen to know these kind of people. Uh, six of them are my kids, and they are quite uh, thriving through uncertainty. They are sort of self-employed, where I only became self-employed 30 years later. And I see some in my work, actually, in this city council, beautiful, 27, could be my daughter, and understanding what's happening. So I am getting a little bit humble. I felt it directly. What kind of advice? An advice? I would ask them for advice. I asked them for advice. And I think the main advice is, and I'm reading The Good Ancestor by this Roman Knadzic, a very difficult but the book is brilliant. The question is, what can I still do with my remaining 25 years? Because you will live longer than me. How can we speed up the process of you becoming a manager in this organization whilst the normal uh, way of things is that you have to wait for 20 years and get the job? But if, if I see you now, you should be there already. So please advise me what I can do to help you because you have everything in it and more than me. I took me it took me 30 years more to get your wisdom. <laughs> and uh, so I want to be uh, I want to be a good ancestor and I shouldn't ask my parents, I should ask my my children. Case I have to tell you that this is the first time that one of my guests said that they would ask the young person. Oh, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. You know, I I never thought about it asking that way. And yet I know that when I work with students, I always say to them, you know, I'm only going to ask you questions because you have it all. Uh, it's there. You just, I just have to help you pull it out by asking yeah. questions. Yeah, so this is beautiful. Yeah. Maybe the general, thank you for this response, because maybe the general management team of the city council would have said, Case, this is not what we, we want an answer to this question, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we finish, Case, you know, this will be archived and it's on my website uh, and I'll give the, the, uh, the URL a little bit later uh, and you can always direct them to watch. <laughs> It'll be in English, but <laughs> I will. I start with my friends and then they will bring it further. There you go. There Slowly. You go. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, I have to say, this has been so pleasurable having this conversation with you. Uh, as as it always is when you and I talk. <laughs> Whether it's here on the show or it's it's in other uh, other venues, shall we say. 
uh, it's I I am I'm always struck with your humanness as you as you respond. Uh, it's 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 when I used the word integrity uh, earlier, and I think that's what that's what comes forth. Uh, when I work with with uh, managers, I often will remind them that they always must be authentic when they're speaking to their staff. And they, they kind of shake their heads and they don't know quite what that means. I said, well, just keep thinking about it because you'll find that your messages will get through much more clearly. So your integrity is coming through as an authenticity. Um, Thank you. I'll, and you know what? Right. People say, if you get feedback, then take it seriously when it's coming from a person you highly appreciate that you know that actually the, the that knows about the feedback that he or she is giving so i highly appreciate your feedback it takes one to know one i guess <laughs> thank you well in case again thank you so much do you have any final words that you would like to to share with the audience i don't have them but a certain poem poet uh Rainer maria rilke uh, had them at 120 years ago yeah and it goes like this I would like to beg you, dear sir, as well as I can, to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves, as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday, far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. That is the most beautiful poem. I, I, I want you to send that to me, please. And I'm going to post it on my website. I, I think it is uh, truly remarkable. That, that What was that final word, to live into the answer? Yes, don't try to answer the questions, live them, live your questions and you will live your way into the answer. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> yeah. every time I get a chance to, <laughs> to have a recital here, I, I will take. <laughs> well, you know, I often use poetry when I'm speaking or teaching. Uh, the, we, I don't think we appreciate that art form of, of poetry because it's, <clears throat> it is so ephemeral. It's auditory. It's not the written word. It's the auditory word that's hitting you. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a true beauty in it. So again, my deep appreciation for your presence today. Uh, it's been enormous fun. It was. Thank you very much. And a mm. big namaste. Namaste. For you and everyone who feels some generativity with this conversation we had. Very good. Thank you, Case. Thank you. Ah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Goodness, as is, it's getting to me, this is such an interesting conversation. I wish it could go on. Uh, I always enjoy how Case brings the world into my into my world. It, he changes it every time we speak. Uh, and and I that final phrase from Rilke, uh, amazing. In a moment, I'm going to tell you about next year, next week's exciting guest. But first, I have <clears throat> I have found this conversation useful, and if you have, make a comment in social media about what you learned, and what to to do differently as a result. And if you're on YouTube, click the like button and make a comment. I really will read them. I really will. And as always, send me ideas about what you would like to hear more about. Uh, I can see so many things of what, what Case and I spoke about today that could be unpacked. So if anything piques your curiosity, write to me at madeline at madelineblair.com. I love hearing from you. And if I use your topic, you will receive a copy of my book, Essays in Two Voices. It's being used across four continents. Now for next week. We'll be in conversation with Cara Michelle Nethers. 
She is a licensed acupuncturist, functional nutrition counselor, and personal trainer. Her passion is discovering new ways to simplify health and wellness. And if you are serious about your career, you know that you have only one body to bring and carry you through it. So why not take care of it? Be sure to put it on your calendar and join us on June the 8th at noon Eastern here on E360 TV or live on my YouTube channel, Madeline Blair. Anytime you feel the need for some inspiration, the archives of all my shows are at www.madelineblair.com slash media. Just scroll down and you'll see them. And of course, please check out my book, Unlocked, on Amazon. Thank you for joining us on this segment of Unlocked. I'm Madeline Blair, wishing you infinite possibilities as you unlock your resilience.